Hi. I was going to start off with a, a mountaineering story. I'll come to that. Let me just put things in perspective for you. I most definitely did not get a first. Right? I scraped through an economics and marketing degree with the skin of my teeth. I don't even think I graduated because I didn't go to the ceremony. I think they call me Strathclyde Qualified. But I'm not allowed to say I'm a graduate because I didn't go to the ceremony. My mum's still upset at me because I don't have the little picture of me and my hat on in the robes. Why was that? Because while I was doing my degree, I was the lead singer in a metal band. I mean, we rocked, right? And I didn't mean I was, I kind of walk about going, I'm in a band. I mean, we were the best new band on Radio 1. We were 29 in the charts. We were 12th fastest selling single in the UK and all that stuff. And to give an idea of what I looked like, and by people go, what was your band called? I never tell them. Because you know the wrestler? Imagine a slimmer, less beat up version of that. The hair, the trousers, that was me, right? So trying to look like you're a Californian rock god when you live in East Kilbride <laughs> takes guts. But here's the, th here's the thing. I learned more about launching businesses and being that band than I could have learned anywhere. How do you sell that concert with no money? How do you persuade the keyboard player in Simple Minds, who was the biggest band in the world at the time, to record your single for you? How do we get this gig to give us a chance? How do you do all this with not having any budget? Same things. So when I finally went into business, everyone in my family thought I was completely unemployable. I found it relatively straightforward. I couldn't fit in in jobs. I couldn't do it. I actually got quite depressed, not, not too depressed, but I thought, I, I don't think I can do this. It wasn't until I had more in business that I began to flourish. So there you go. And now thinking about loving what you do. I play guitar a lot, and I never feel like I'm working. All right, so the guys who are, heavy metal gets a bad rap, right? To be a good heavy metal guitarist, they're virtuosos, and they practice, my mates, they practice 17 hours a day, some of them. They don't feel like they're working. So don't do the thing you're going to do unless you cannot stop doing it and you can't stop thinking about it, because it will be a complete and utter grind for you. And when you compete against somebody who does have that emotional content inside them, they won't feel like they're competing with you. They'll just be doing what they love, and they'll just batter you out of the way. Because you'll go, oh, another day at the office, and they'll be like, oh, I can't, I've been thinking about this all last night, I couldn't sleep. And they will bring that to the table. So I'm going to talk about your values, and we talk about maybe things that will help you clarify that in yourself. So, I do the whole rock thing. I don't have a job until I'm about 28. I launch my business when I'm 30. I get loads of time. And then in 2001, when I was 31, I go on a climbing expedition to Kashmir. It was a French expedition. And I wanted to climb two mountains. I wanted to climb Broad Peak and its more famous neighbor, K2. And to put that in perspective, more people have been in space than have climbed K2. And one in three of the people who climb it die on the way down. It is brutal, but I didn't know that. I was trained up. I was ready. But there's one quote in business. There's a quote I love in business. I thought it was Frederick the Great of Prussia. I'm a wee history square, incidentally. Turns out it's not. I've said so many speeches in, as Frederick the Great said, and I think I've been wrong, he didn't say it, but there you go. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's just the way it is. So if you're one of these real kind of rigid types, but I've got my plan, the market will go, really? That's what I think of your plan, what you could do now, smarty pants. So you have to change and change and change and change and change. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. So even though I had the best equipment and I was at my peak fitness and I knew what I was doing and I was ready and I had all my medicines and my equipment and everything, I went through an ordeal the likes of which I could never, ever have imagined. It was what happened around me. But I thought I was going to see the world from the top of the second highest mountain. And instead, I saw the world through the eyes of a child. And I believe that's what I was meant to see. So what was it about this thing that changed me? And what lessons can you take from this? You arrive in northern Kashmir. Incredible, incredible place. I mean, I love history. You go into a village, and there'll be a guy with red hair and like whiter skin than me, next to a guy who looks very what you'd think someone from Pakistan looks like, next to a guy who looks as if he was kind of Asiatic. Monkey go, how do you all look like this? The guy with the red hair laughed and said, Alexander the Great. And the guy who looked Asiatic went, Genghis Khan. All the armies went through there. There's people there who still speak ancient Greek. Kandahar is named after Alexander the Great, Iskandahar. It's magical. And the people are formidable. That's why they've defeated everybody who's ever gone in there. And when I was there, 
put this in perspective, you go fly into Islamabad and then you drive to Skardu over the Karakoram Highway, it takes you days, and you arrive in the middle of nowhere. Then you walk for a week over the ice to the border of India, China, and you're in Pakistan. And you can hardly breathe because of the altitude. And the people are the most majestic, noble, toughest people you could imagine. I would wake up after climbing for seven hours over ice in my tent the next day, and there'd be a queue of people waiting for me. Some of them pregnant women, heavily pregnant women, because they'd heard there was Westerners there, which meant there was medicine. And that woman had crossed the same ice I had just for some medicine. I ended up giving away all my stuff. So I became very good friends with my guide, whose name was Cher. His name means lion. And he was, from, he was so charismatic and decent and strong and brave and all those great emotions. He couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Urdu. But we just became best friends. We used to crack each other up. Now, here is the key point of the story. Just ahead, a day or so ahead, there was another French expedition. And there was a young 18-year-old boy there that was found dead in his tent. He died of a cerebral edema, which you're meant to get warning signals for, but he didn't exhibit the traits. They just found him dead, too late for him to get down. They radioed the Pakistani military, and they sent a helicopter for his corpse. I will never forget that helicopter racing past us and all the ice spraying up as it snaked down the glacier and coming back with that boy's body strapped to the side. Back to Paris and broken-hearted parents. So six weeks later, during the climbing expedition, Von Scher collapsed. And I had a duty of care towards Scher, which he didn't realize. I had brought him from another mountain. Because if we got on so well, I said, look, we're going to climb, try and climb Broad Peak in K2. Do you want to come? That was an extra two months' work for him. And he left his two little kids and his wife. And he came to the other, area, the other side of Pakistan to come and climb with us. So he collapsed. His lungs had collapsed. The person that diagnosed him was none other than the Bulgarian Minister for Health. That's the type of people that are on these climbing expeditions. So his lungs collapsed. You make, if he's not down in 24 hours, he's dead. He can't breathe. So what would you do? Let's get him one of those helicopters. Right? On the radio, she has collapsed, he can't breathe. I've been told he's got 24 hours. Could you send one of those helicopters, please? And the answer was no. Why would they send a helicopter for a Westerner's corpse but they wouldn't send a helicopter for a very live Kashmiri tribesman? Why? Because a Westerner could afford it. You hear all these stories about people being left on mountains. There was nothing we could do. There was a lot of things they could have done. They just chose and chose not to. There's a metaphor for life. It's called summit fever. You ignore everything but the summit. And at that point, my values were clarified instantly for me. Because if you either look, I saw what people do not see in our generation. My grandfather's generation saw it repeatedly. The look in the eyes of someone who's going to die. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he just folded it on himself. So what would you do? What would you do? I first lost my temper, <laughs> started crying with rage, and the tears were freezing to my cheeks. And I had axes and crampons on my boots. It was like razor blades, so I'm going berserk, just terror and rage. And then something snapped to me, and I sent off two of the other porters who'd stayed behind to set up camp, and I put them on my back, and I carried them out. Four days it took. I dragged them. I helped him, I carried him, and all he said the whole time was, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. He believed that. And he was in agony. But he's alive to this day. And the second thing I'll never forget is a look when he bumped away on his little truck with his little bag of medicine, which I was trying to tell him. <laughs> I <laughs> went to take what, what medicine when he couldn't read or write and doesn't speak English. Someone asked me if I emailed him the other day. I'm like, yeah, he's on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I should have left with him, but as he bumped away, he looked at me and the look of incomprehension, joy, gratitude, 
it's, when I think of the terror and then the difference that it made, it seared into my soul. And I turned around and walked all the way back because I was mad. All my stuff was there and it cost a fortune and I wanted to go back and get it. And I also thought I could keep climbing. But I developed what was called the Kumbo Cough, named after the Kumbo Ice Fall on Everest, which means when you start coughing 45 minutes later, you're still coughing and spitting blood up. I had that. I was two stone lighter. Couldn't feel my fingers or toes. I was a wreck. But you're not thinking straight at that altitude. I go back. I realize that um, time's running out for me, so I headed out a different direction. And as I was leaving, this was days into the trek on the way out, I collapsed. And I got up and I'd be walking, I'd collapse again. I was completely delirious. And the final time I collapsed, I don't know how long I was out for, but I felt this wee thing tugging my hand. And I looked and there was this little girl looking at me. The most beautiful wee thing you've ever seen. Gorgeous, dressed in rags, covered in mud. Look at me. And I stood up and she was tiny and she was so young, she had one of those wee spongy hands that we kids have. The wee hands are all spongy. Wee. And she led me just over a little ridge and there was our village. Took me to the, some water. I sat down, got some water, came around. She looked at me as if to go, are you okay? And I kind of looked at her and she ran off playing. I go back to Scotland, to the press. I was in the front page of the mirror. I was everywhere. Hero Scott saves Sherpa. I just wanted to go to my bed. Two months later, one of the French climbers who had come out the same way and didn't know that child had helped me took her photograph and emailed it to me amongst all the other climbing expedition pictures. And I'm sitting and still couldn't feel my friends and my fingers, clicking on my computer, and up came that child's face. I'm intentionally not beaming it up, but when you go to our website and you can see it, wildheartsinaction.org, there is the child's face on our business card. And this is where the relevance of this story is going to come right home to you now. Because what do you do when something like that happens to you? What do you do when you have an experience like I couldn't stop thinking about it? See, I'm not descended from landed gentry. One half of my family was Highlanders. The other half were Irish immigrants. <laughs> my friends say I'm totally mental, but at least I can laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandfather was a minor when he was 12. We do a lot of talk talks in schools, and I say to the 12-year-olds, so, where are you going after the summer? We're going to high school. If you were my grandfather, you'd be going down a mine, and you wouldn't see the sun from October till March. My father's father. And when he died in his 90s, he was, he'd lost his mind when he was in his deathbed, and he looked at me and said, oh, Michael, son, how you doing? Yeah, Michael, I know it's Mick Jackson, but I'm hiding the fact that my name's Michael Jackson. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> my son is not called Michael. He looked at me and said, son, did you ever go to university? I was like, yeah, I did. I went years ago. And this, I'm not saying this for dramatic effect. The last words he said to me before he died, as he then, his eyes drifted across the room, was, I wish I'd had that chance. So he fights to get out of being a child laborer. My dad's brought up in a slum in Glasgow, used to get an apple for his Christmas, literally, and his wee brother used to take a bite out of it. And then I get to live in East School Bride and go to a comprehensive free, go to a secondary school free, get to go to university, get a degree, get to be a musician, ride about on a motorbike with leather trousers on and get that out of my system. And then I live in a country where, when my father was dying of cancer, he got the best treatment free that didn't bankrupt our family. My son was born shortly after, with the best medical treatment for my wife was in the theater, free. And I even get grants to start a business. We live in paradise. And when people bitch about this country, it boils my blood because they have never seen what life can be like. Like in Bolivia, with the guy with the submachine gun on the bank going, oh, sorry, if you've not got a white face, you're not getting in. You're a woman, forget it. Or in Guatemala, where we get held up with the guys with the machetes. Or Zanzibar, where they were begging because I'd put them out of business being an internet travel company. And they used to make their money getting chitties of paper to the tourists and getting commission on the scuba diving companies. I put them out of business without realizing it. And people like me, they have no idea. There's only two things you're allowed to bitch about in Scotland. The weather and midges. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. A nation of brats. 
So what do you do with that experience? You turn to drink, you become really bitchy and jaded, you go, ah, oh, the world's really hard, yeah, you may be happy, but I know what the world, no, what do you do? You kick into what you know about, and what did I know? Business. I'd already built up a business that was doing pretty well, turning over millions, I thought it was really exciting, and I knew lots of people, and I had credibility with them. So I began to obsess. To obsess. Now here's the thing. People talk about studying. I didn't know what a social entrepreneur was. I didn't know what venture philanthropy was. I didn't know what microfinance was. I knew nothing. I just had one hell of a motivation. And I knew that the money that transacted on a daily basis was vast. What if we could just tap into it? What if we could just divert some of it like a little litigation system? Not charity. Not asking for donations. I didn't feel right doing that. It wasn't my background. How'd you do it? Now, bearing in mind that I thought I was a junior rock god, what does someone brought up in that environment do when they grow up? Well, they become a musician, they do this. What did I end up launching? You start thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it and think, how do you create wealth from companies to help the poor? I didn't know what helping the poor, how I was going to do that either, without asking for donations. How do you do that? Now, whether you're religious or not, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto thee whether you're religious or you just like the poetry of it, that is one of the things I live my business by. Because if you ask enough, it always comes. But not if you go, oh, I wonder how I could help people, get, women getting beaten in their own home and being second-class citizens in the developing world. Why do I do that? Oh, so TV is good, sorry. Well, she's nice. Forget it. If you're a passive enthusiast, forget it. How do you do it? And then I was in someone's office in Edinburgh, a woman, and I said, how much you spent all this rubbish? Pens and folders, and how do you spend all this rubbish? Your desk cluttered, I have no idea. Uh, how much do we spend on the office buys? Quarter of a million comes down, so whoa, who, who'd you buy it from? I have no idea. You spend quarter of a million, you have no idea who you buy it from. No, nah. do you care? <laughs> no, nah. bang. That was it. The most boring thing in the world, your office supplies. Every reason visible to pens and paper, and totally invisible. We spend a fortune on it, six billion a year in this country. No one gives a damn where they get it from. But they have to buy it. Did I have an office supplies background? Most certainly not. Was it my dream to sell Tipex as a boy? No. So then you begin to make investigations and you find out that I could set up a warehousing system UK wide, six warehouses the size of Hamden. I could have 20,000 products and I could go head to head with the multinationals. But there had to be a condition. I formed a charity called Wild Hearts that would own the office supplies company. So I wouldn't own it. And then I poured my heart and soul into it. And when I went to the bank, and I was talking about, you've really got to want this, and you've got to have that fight in you, the bank. And I'd put millions through that bank, and they were very excited what we were doing. And I said, I need to be overdraft. Oh, well, Mike, you're giving all the money away to the poor. That's the point, you muppet. <laughs> oh, well, we're not sure. And I said, OK, Angus Morrison of the Bank of Scotland. <laughs> I will personally guarantee this. And I will never let you forget it. Never used that overdraft once. But if I didn't want it enough, I'd have went, secure the debt for a company I don't own that. No way. Oh, there's all these companies with CSR brochures. You actually scratch me to the surface. It's a farce. No disrespect to the Bank of Scotland, because Angus was pretty good, but he wouldn't give us the overdraft. So I underwrite it, and now it turns over millions, and we give hundreds of thousands of you every year to help the poor. What is that? I give away more than I could ever have imagined, and I've never felt richer. There's the lesson. Money and wealth are not the same things. I know so many self-made millionaires. One lives in his castle, and he's got a wee sad face, and said to me last time, is this it? <laughs> you know, you know if you do <laughs> Is this it? What do you think? Everyone was going to fancy you. We're all going to laugh at your jokes. <laughs> Did you think this was it? It's not what you have, it's what you do that makes you happy. That's the lesson. Don't learn it too late. So, what do we do with the money? Do you know I went to speak to the big famous charities, all TV adverts, and none of them would return my calls? None of them would return my calls. One of them said, there is not the appetite in our organization for that level of innovation. And then I exploded and started swearing and said, appetite, appetite. You say you save children and you're talking about appetite. 
You're lucky you've got a damn appetite. The people you purport to help don't have that luxury. Too much innovation. And that's the danger now. The business world is looking very keenly at the charity world, and it has been shown in many instances to be wanting. Not all of them, though. Some great ones, but some of them. All right, so what do I do? And then everything happens for a reason. I keep looking, I keep looking. Then I meet Mel Young that brought the big issue to Scotland. And he said, you heard of Mohammed Junis? No. You heard of Grameen Bank? No. Told me about it. Wow. What does someone who studied economics and loves business and comes from a background of people who worked their way out of poverty, would not give any handouts, if you tried to give my grandfather charity, he'd have knocked you in your backside. That was the culture. You work your way out. And then you find out there's a guy who's pioneered lending money to the poor. That's it. And that's what we do. Microfinance has been so successful now. One of our researchers is getting tweets about the stories about some people saying it's getting you know, some bad instances of microfinance in India or instances here. Yeah, why? Because it's a business. It's not something that has little pictures of wee kids and you go, yeah, give us a tenner and we'll send you a picture of a wee kid. You indulge me in the specifics. It's because it's business, and like anything, if we were to charge 95% interest, we would be loan sharks as well. But we don't, we charge 15%. Who's heard of microfinance? Interesting, vast majority, I'm loving it. <laughs> My wee stars down there. I'm loving it because the vast majority, yes, that was a big business audience, not one hand. So here's some facts for you. 40% of the world's population has no access to credit. 75% of the world's population of women, no access to credit in any shape or form. You ask, a business icon, and I'm not being cheesy, Tom. You ask a guy of Tom's, Tom, how would you do without banking, investment, any loans, somebody to deposit money? I have yet to find a businessman or woman who can function without banking, yet we expect the world's poor to do it. When our banking system began to go into meltdown, we described it as the end of our way of life. And Niall Ferguson, the economist in the ascent of money, said the Western civilization would have been impossible without banking. And yet we expect the world's poorest to get along without it. So that's what I get into. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of businesses now funded in West Africa. And I can announce to the first audience to hear, we've just moved into Bolivia and Peru. And this sounds really arrogant. And we're in talks with Cambodia, <laughs> like the whole country. Hello, Cambodia. How are you? <laughs> now, when I see a bunch of Scots going, ah, well, you know, and it's really me, I show them this. Maestro, could you click on Jumping Dance, please? Anyone who follows us on Facebook, don't shout out the answer. If you follow us on Facebook, if you've been on our website, don't say, what was that? What was that a video of? People usually say it was a wedding, a birthday party. What was that a video of? A bank meeting. <laughs> I said to guys in Royal Bank of Scotland, why don't you have your meetings like that? Like, shut up, Michael. <laughs> I remember doing a speech. Paid a lot of money to do a speech at a leading bank, and they're really nice people. I'm not slagging bankers, and I've got loads of friends in banks, and they got a rap for things that wasn't their, wasn't their fault. And they were all bitching about how hard things were, and they're like, oh, no, it's really hard, it's really hard. One of them complained that the favourite flavour of Ben and Jerry's wasn't available in the reception, and they turned the chocolate fountain off. I was like, ah, yeah, that's hard times. Get a grip of yourselves. So. That's a bank meeting. They didn't do it as a performance because the Europeans had turned up. They didn't do it. We were trying to scramble with the cameras to film that in 40 degree heat with the camera melting. And that is the sheer explosion of joy. If you take women who've been told they're second class citizens and you give them access to a loan, not a handout, a loan. And I didn't tell a single one of those women what business they have. They all had businesses. And I didn't say who got in the group and who didn't. They all vet each other. And they have a 99% repayment rate. Internationally, all their loans have been repaid at 100%. The American Joint Chief of Staff have identified the economic empowerment of women 
as their strategy for this to tackling extremism. Because in cultures where women are marginalized and don't have a voice, there is no coincidence they are fundamentalist, extremist, mired in poverty, and chaotic. It's also been shown that in these countries, if a man has access to the, the family income, but 30% is reinvested in the family. When the woman has it, it's 90%. Look at me, do I look like a feminist? I mean, I saw a t-shirt on 30 Rock, and a guy said, had a t-shirt going, this is what a feminist looks like with a wee fist. That's the creepiest t-shirt a guy could wear, if you ask me, right? I don't have a feminist agenda. I've got no brothers, two big sisters, really successful, and my mum was the business person in the family. I grew up in a very confident female environment. It's just normal for me, but I'm not going to go, I'm going to help women. How patronizing. I didn't need to. Like, you want the securest people to lend your money to? Lend it to them. You'll get it all back. And the education goes up. The nutrition goes up, they start voting, they start learning to read and write, and they start standing up for themselves. And that's who that little child is. She's on the front cover of our website. She is the daughter of one of the second women being lifted up. And when we asked her to smile, she wouldn't. And when she said, why not? She was the man from Wild Hearts has come to the village. There was four of us. And when she was told that the Wild Hearts people were there, she says, I get to go to school now. I want to be a nurse. And I don't go to bed hungry because my mummy's got a business. And I take that very seriously. She was almost reverential. An amazing wee girl. So what's all this got to do with you? Would you hear this? So people say, all right, you're doing that in these different countries. What about Scotland? What about, Scotland? What about the poverty in Scotland? Coming at me, I said, okay, let's talk about poverty in Scotland. And I talked to people, and I went and engaged with them, and it kept coming back. It's never material. It's always the way they feel. I'm not mocking that. Like, it's the way we feel. It's, we, I, I feel as if I could never do it. It's the way I feel. And, it's, and if you have been brought up in an environment of three generations of unemployment, and you've never worked in your peer group, of, I just could have no inspiration in them. It is like someone saying to me, Mick, you know the business environment's changing. Your next business, you're going to have to speak Mandarin, okay? So we'll see you next week. I don't speak Mandarin. Well, try harder. No, 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 I don't speak Mandarin. Well, you know, you just got to get your act together. No, you don't. No one has ever taught me. I don't know anybody. I know the odd person that speaks it, but no one in my family never taught me in school. No one taught me it. My dad never went to work. I never saw what a, a responsible wage earner is like. I've never met a business, but I don't know the rules. I don't know how to do it. To expect them to transform is not going to happen. But we must never make excuses for people, and we must never write them off. So from everything I know about all the kids in our schools that are going to achieve this when they could have been this, and all the companies in our culture, that people are full of people that are coasting when they should have been world class, and all the business graduates and all the people in uni getting churned out every year. Surely we should be creating multi-millionaires every generation, but we're not, because we're coasting. All right, all right, I'm going to prove it. I am going to do the equivalent of this for our culture. And I came up with this idea called micro -tyco. And I got, I asked Fiona Downey from Determined to Succeed to get me two teams of five kids. And they would apply to Wild Hearts for a microloan of a pound. And they had four weeks to turn the pound into as much money as they could. And all they had was their inner resources, their inner wealth, their ingenuity, their creativity. It had to be legal, but they had nothing else but their ideas, what was in them. And from that seed that would bear fruit, we would then use it to start entrepreneurs. And these kids would go from being dynamic wealth creators to global ethical investors. Right, so the top earning team, I gave them a pound. How much did the team of 11-year-olds turn their money into? Somebody shout it out, not if you know the answer. Come on, you give the team of six 11-year-olds a pound. Four weeks later, I'll be primary school in East Kilbride. How much money to turn a pound into? Come on, somebody. A thousand pounds. More oh, ambitious, come on. Four thousand pounds. Four thousand pounds. Naturally brilliant. And they're here today. Girls. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are in the presence of entrepreneurial genius. And I know if Sir Tom Hunter could get a return of four grand on a pound, that is legendary. And what does it show? Our kids are brilliant. So what happened since then? Fiona Downey sends the email out. 
challenged me. I'd only thought the idea up. She went, let's do it in two weeks. Challenged me to do it. It goes to Eileen Tompkins, the head teacher of the school. There are so many brilliant head teachers that give the kids this permission, unspoken permission to excel. She set that tone in the school. Those kids deliver those results. Oh, by the way, I forgot, going back, Caroline Dealman from uh, Stuart Milne Group said, can our company only buy office supplies from you? Is there nothing else? Well, I've got this idea called Microtycho. Quote, that's the best business training idea I've heard. Our people would thrive on that. So you've got the business person, Fiona Downey, Eileen Tompkins, then Dr. John Park at the RGU gets a hold of it and makes this Microtycho a compulsory part of doing a business degree at RGU. And any business, if we'll be tied to any business graduate, because do you have to do that? Are you sure you should be doing a business degree? And then I meet Fiona and our team at SIE, and they go, Mick, we love this. Let's do this. There's companies that have enterprise in their title. They're not very enterprising. This one is. Let's do this. So every intern through all the universities is promoting microtyco in the universities. And I'm going to close on this. It's going to run every November. And whether it's IBM or the Blyswood Hotel or the Stuart Milne Group, all the companies all putting their people in to compete against the students in the unis. And then the kids in the schools will compete against each other. If anyone says, well, I don't know, I'm a student, how am I going to get a job? Go in for micro blow people out the water, and then they say, so why should we give you a job, say, because I demolished you at micro and I'm really concerned at the lack of skills and enterprise in your company. You need me. <laughs> That's how you differentiate yourself. And that is how this country will get its spirit back. And that is how we will inspire each other rather than get looking at those morons on the media. And we will learn from the real business people. And our kids will raise their aspirations and our companies will raise their games. I had two goals today. One was to impart my passion for you. Go on to Facebook and join World Hearts Nation on Facebook. Join us because all the people I've mentioned are World Hearts Ambassadors. Alex Barton on the stage, World Hearts Ambassador. Glenn Buckin, World Hearts Ambassador. Fiona and Eileen and Karen, World Hearts Ambassadors. It's like Fight Club, we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right? And this is the thing. For the wee kid, how did I become a musician? My dad was tone deaf. I watched American rock musicians. I wanted to be like them. I never met them. So the goal was one. My second goal was to ask Sir Tom Hunter, would he please be a video mentor and join Bob Keeler of PSN and Colin Stewart, the head of Citibank, and all my mates who are going to mentor you to camera, would he do it? Bingo. So I, if you give me a big enough applause, means I've achieved both goals. And um, with the micro tackle, it means whereas I watched Tom's career and wanted to be like him, and then he said he was going to give all his money away, and went, well, I want to be like him even more. Now these kids of Scotland are going to get access to that, and so will you. This is a game changer. No more excuses. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>